welcome to the chapel online, no matter the time or the place that you're joining us from today. We hope, we trust, we pray that you feel inspired, uplifted and encouraged as you partake in our service and lean into God. If you'd like to know what's going on at our church, you can head to our website, thechapelcollective.com.au or you can scan the QR code right on the screen now. That gives a lot of information about what's going on. There's something for everyone and there's ways to get connected into the church. There's also ways to give electronically of your tithes and offerings uh, in an automated way. Connect groups are a vital part of our community. This is where we build friendships and relationships with people in our community and we learn more about God as we do life together. If you would like to sign up for one, please email info at thechapelcollective.com.au or go to our website under the next steps section so that you can express your interest and we can help find a group that's suitable for you. Hey ladies, Shine Conference is on and it's happening on the 26th and the 27th of August this year. If you haven't done so already, go to the Shine Conference website, which is shineconference.com.au and register now. Bring a friend, it's going to be absolutely amazing. Catalyst Sunday is happening on the 24th of July. We're gonna to throw to a video now with our senior pastors, Daz and Brom, to hear about the vision God's given to them for our next big stages. Hi everybody. Hey, Catalyst offering is coming fast now and we want to take a moment to point you to it. This year's Catalyst offering is all about seeding the future. Uh, so many churches end up a product of the past and we want to in this moment really position for the future. And so today we're asking you to start to think about seeding that financially. We haven't had a Catalyst offering for a couple of years now um, in most locations due to the pandemic. Uh, but we want to draw a line in the sand, put a stake in the ground and say, let the future begin. Um, so would you pray about what you might sacrificially give because we know that usual tithes and offerings don't get it done and we want to um, launch into everything that God has for us. Yeah, let's do something big this year. Let's do something that is God can take and cause to be miraculous as we build the future. God bless you. Coming up in our service, we're going to be led through some powerful worship from our worship team. And then we have a guest speaker for our Hot Sundays. Dr. Patricia Weirakoon is a Christian speaker, author, academic, and sexologist. And she's going to be speaking about some stuff that maybe little ears may not want to be around for. I'll let you discern whether it's appropriate, but she doesn't hold back. So we're going to pray to open up. Father God, thank you so much that we have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Patricia Wirakoon this morning and to be led in powerful worship. Lord, open our hearts. May we have an encounter with you. May we learn something and may we finish this service better people, deeper in understanding and experience with you. We ask this in your mighty name. Amen. Your love was 
you're enjoying the service so far. It's now time to hear from our guest speaker, Dr. Patricia Weirakoon, over a pre-recorded Zoom platform. We are so grateful that you're here, um, Patricia, via technology. And, uh, and we've got all our locations linking in. So we've got Gyra and Armadale and Bendemir and Gunnedah and the Port crew as well. So um, we're really leaning in today to hear all that you have to say to us. And, uh, and we'll just throw to you and then at the end we'll throw to questions. So um, there will be the question slide come up at some point. And even in the locations, if you're quick, you may be able to get your questions answered as well. And let me tell you, this wonderful woman, there's no question that is too awkward for her to answer. So I will throw to you right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your kindness and your patience and your tolerance in allowing me to link in techne technologically to you on Zoom. So it's absolutely great to be with you and particularly so to discuss what is today a very important area, both for you 
And my heart is with the children, so especially for your children. So my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in all those wonderful country towns you are in, greetings from a wet, windy, misty Sydney. So what are we going to talk about today? I have titled the topic Sex, Gender and Identity, Seeking and Speaking the Truth. Why that topic heading? I want to take you firstly to Ephesians chapter 4, 14 and 15, where it says, where Paul says, no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. So that's what you're not to be. You are to stand firm as people of the word in a deceitful culture where the deceit has invaded even the church. Now, by denominational affiliation, whatever that means, I am an Anglican. And within our very Anglican church, we are seeing this deceitfulness of the world seeping in, especially when it comes to sex and gender. Then Paul goes on to say, rather speaking the truth in love, grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So that is what we are supposed to end up as. So we don't follow the deceit of the world, but rather we grow up in the word. And right in between is that little phrase, speaking the truth in love. That is what we are called to do. The deceitful world called to be God's people, but speaking the truth in love into a very confused culture. So what do we need? We need to know the truth. If you're going to speak the truth, you better know the truth. We need to understand, especially in sex and gender, the science behind it. And I'm going to give you a very brief overview. We just don't have the time to do anything more in detail, but please contact me and um, you can get my email from one of your pastors or your admin team. I'm happy to send you more information or references in this area. So we will look at the science and we will broadly look at our cultural moment and we will ground this in what the word of God has to say about it. So we want to look at science, our current, what we call world of transgender ideology, and then ground it in God's word and learn or explore how to speak with courage and compassion while standing firmly on the conviction of the word. So let's start with science. Now, why or how am I qualified to speak to you? It is because I have trained in this area for many, many, many years. Now, I am 75 years old. When I was young and in Sri Lanka, I went to medical school long time ago, like dinosaur era. And there I finished medical school, was teaching in university, and I did my postgraduate study in Hawaii. While in Hawaii, I worked, this is 1980, I worked with a Professor Diamond who was one of the world's best known people in gender. Now at that time, I was helping him in what was called transsexual clinics. Now there were just a few people who had problems with their feelings of who they were and we call this transsexualism. Now, why am I telling you all this? It is because to give you the background that as scientists and biologists and doctors in the area, we have always thought of three, and hang on here because I'm going to give you a lot of information very briefly in a short time. 
we talked of three areas or categories of sex, gender, and identity. The basic one was biology. What do you look like? What are you born as? Biology. Well, that was something that was very much taken for granted for a very, very long time, but not now, but I'll come to that. So there's biology, male, female. Then there is how you behave. We call that gender expression now, but in the old days, when I was studying it in 1980s, we just considered that as gender. So biology is your sex. Gender was how you expressed it in behavior. And then we had sexual orientation, which was who are you sexually attracted to? And that's where the gay, les, bi came in. So we were three. Then about 10 years ago, there slipped in a fourth category. And this was this unmeasurable, ephemeral feeling, which was the inner sense, or so we were told, of who you truly are. And this was given the name of gender identity. So four things. But now we have four. We used to have three. Biology. That's your sex. Sex is biology. Your behavior or expression. Your who you are attracted to sexually and behave with. And that's sexual orientation. And this ephemeral new feeling. Now, biological sex is scientific. We can measure it. Let's sit with it for a few moments. After all, we live in a time when people, even politicians, can't define woman. What is a woman? Who knows? A woman is whoever says they are a woman, we are told. But then what do they say they are? Who knows? Right. We'll come back to that. But the reality is, and this is really important we understand this, your sex is determined at the moment when your mommy and daddy's sperm and ova met. Daddy's sperm carried either a Y chromosome or an X chromosome. I'm giving you the quickie version of biology here, okay? Hang, in, hang on to your chest. Either an X or a Y. Now, mom's egg always had an X. So your sperm comes along and woohoo, I made it. So it depends which one made it. If the Y made it, then you have an XY and that's a boy. And if the X sperm made it, then that's an XX baby and that's going to be a girl and that's the excitement you know in psalm 139 king david writes you knit me in my mother's womb that's the knitting sperm and over and guess what your mommy and daddy were not knitting at that moment they were having the best sex ever and for you younger ones they were also having the best orgasm ever go home today and if you're having lunch with your parents, ask them about it. So, you need me. Sex, therefore, is determined at that moment of conception or fertilization. And you can follow it through pregnancy with visual ultrasound imaging. It is only confirmed visually at birth. So, you already know boy, girl. That's very important for us to understand. Biology is established in the womb. Now, once a baby is born, you go grow up and you go through puberty. And for you older people, it may be just a distant memory, puberty. For you younger ones, it's probably like last year or whatever it was. And you know, it's a time when you go from a little e to a big one. I'm not going through all the details, but there are changes that take place in the brain and in the body that we call secondary characteristics. All this is biology. Now, Genesis created male, female, which I've just told you biology. Now we're still sitting with biology. In about 0 0.02, that's a very few, 0 0.02 of births, this clear male-female differentiation doesn't take place. 
and you have a baby born with what we call ambiguous genitalia. That is where, you know, you already know it's an XX or an XY, but the genitals, they haven't quite developed the way they should. 0.02. Now, I want to give you a couple of very important points here. One, this is called a disorder of sex development. The word disorder, today's culture, the transgender ideologies say, oh, we should call it a difference. It's not, it's a disorder. Something has gone wrong. And the popular word for that is intersex. That's not a very helpful word. But think about it for a moment. It kind of implies that there's male and there's female, and then there is some kind of secondary thing, which is like a third sex, wrong. There is male and female, and thing, very few people where the development has not gone clearly male or female, but they still are male or female, the genital development disorder. Now, the reality is that in our culture today, we are told that that indicates, intersex indicates a third sex. Wrong. There is no third sex. It is also wrong to say that there's male and female and then something in between. It's called a spectrum. Wrong. Clearly male or female. Okay, that's about biology. Now, the second thing I told you was how you express yourself, how you dress, how you speak, how, what you like to play, what games you like to play. Throw your minds back to when you were little children. Now, science, now this too, we can study in cultures. It's very culturally determined and we can study it in cultures. There is no brain area where we can say that's where behavior rests, unlike in the XYXX in biology. But there is some study that we can do. It's observable. Research shows us, and this is really interesting, research shows us that for about 30% of the studied children and young adults, about 30% of uh, characteristics overlap. So if you sort of go boy characteristics, girl characteristics, in the middle, there's about 30% of characteristics which pretty much overlap between girl and boy. So there's no clear stereotype boy, girl. Now we need to be aware of this. We give it a name. We call it gender non-conforming children. I want you to stay with this for a moment. When I was growing up, I was super gender non-conforming long time ago in the tea plantations of Sri Lanka in 1950s. And I hated being a girl. You know, conservative Christian family, what we call Tamil ethnically. And I was being told I have to do all these girl things like cooking and cleaning while my two brothers could be out there climbing the mango tree and have riding their bicycles. Like, hello, who wanted to be a girl? I so wanted to be a boy. Today, if that was the case, I would have been Patrick, not Patricia. But at that time, my mother would say, go kick a ball with your brothers and then come back and help me with the cooking and cleaning. And so I outgrew that feeling. I was a tomboy and you're familiar with that. Now there are boys who like doing girl things and girls who like doing boy things. That's a 30% gender non-conforming kids. Now, because it is these curves like this, there are some boys who actually are more girlish we call it effeminate, then the majority of girls and some girls who will actually be more boyish in their behavior than many boys. That too is normal. We accepted it. Today, that's not what is being done. These children who are these kind of non-stereotype behavior kids are being told because you don't like to behave the way girls behave, you're a girl, and you don't like to behave the way girls behave, you must be a boy. And similarly, you're a boy who doesn't belong or behave the way boys are expected, you must be a girl. That's what we are being told. So we've talked about biology, we talked about behavior. Now, sexual orientation is who are you sexually attracted to and have 
or want to have sex, intimacy with. Now, I said two things. Who are you attracted to? And who you have sex with? Who you are attracted to, desire rests in your brain. Now, desire is driven by a hormone called testosterone. And as far as we know, over a couple of decades of research, this sexual, same-sex sexuality or attraction, that's the lesbian, gay, or we can include the bisexual, attracted to both, there is for some people this innate brain attraction or feeling. Okay, so stay there. The research shows us that for some people, they have a predisposition to same sex attraction. Now, what is the word I use? Predisposition for the feeling, for the desire. Hold that thought. It is not a predetermination of behavior. Behavior, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is always a choice. Self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. We live in a culture that says, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our cultural moment of transgender ideology. We live in a culture that says, if you desire it, if you feel it, you have to have it. So if you desire same sex sexuality, the attraction, you must behave that way. But all the research tells us that even people who feel that way often choose not to live that way. And many Christians we know are in that situation where they will openly say, I feel same sex attracted. I have felt that way from the time I'm a child. But because I believe that God has a better story for my life, I choose to live a celibate, chaste life. And so I don't have sex. Is it going to kill me? No. Is it mean that I'm going to be the unhappiest person on earth? No, these are happy, fulfilled people. Confession moment. My son is a 47-year-old single man. He's a Presbyterian minister. And he likes to tell people, I'm a sexually satisfied virgin. Because he says, I don't have to have sex to know my sexuality and to know that God is far better than the biggest orgasm. And heaven will be better than the best sex you can ever have. And that is a fact. True joy rests at God's right hand. And so, and that means we follow God's good plan. So we've talked about these three things that we've always studied. Now, breaking into this is this ephemeral, unmeasurable essence of we are told of inner feeling of who you are. Sometimes they call it even the inner soul of who you are. It answers this question of who am I? I must look into myself and find out who I am. And I have to live that out. So I can be anything I choose to be. And I'll come back to that cultural moment in a while. That is unmeasurable. There is no science behind it. There is no brain sight that we can find. There is no evidence for a boy brain in a girl body or a girl brain in a boy body. None. Whatever the ideologies may tell you. You cannot be born in the wrong body. You, my dear brother and sister in Christ, are in the body you are meant to be in. This is the body that God has given you. It may not always be the most beautiful and satisfying body. I'm just glancing at you and most of you are young and tight and taut. You get up in the morning and glance at that full length mirror without your clothes and everything's in the right place. I live in a block, in a unit where every bedroom has 
one wall of floor to ceiling mirrors. Early morning out of bed, not a good sight because many parts of the anatomy have shifted far south to Tasmania and beyond. And it's not a good body. I wish that everything was tight and taut as in I was 20, but it is still the body God means me to be in today in my 75th year. So just a dislike of the body doesn't mean that you're not supposed to be in the body that God has given you. Because the God's word is very clear. Let's now go into that. What does God tell us? We are created in the image of God. Genesis chapters 1 and 2. God created humankind, that is mankind, male, female, in his image. God actually in Genesis says, let us make man in our image, the Trinity. The Trinity was besties from eternity to eternity, closest ever. And that's the image we are made in for relationship. The next phrase says, male and female, he created them. This is Genesis. And it's always some people who say, oh, Old Testament, wrong. In Matthew 19, when Jesus was asked about divorce, he points right back. And he says, haven't you read that in the beginning, they were made male and female and they were brought together? And God, having made all the creation and created all the animals and paraded them in front of Adam and Adam named them, but he said, no, nah, none of this is really suitable. I like the dog, but still, you know, not quite enough for me. God says, let's give you a suitable helper. And he creates Eve. And I just love that creation story. Can you just imagine? Think of the best looking man you can ever imagine. For every one of you married women, that's your husband. Best six pack ever and all that. And then God puts him to sleep. That's a bit of a prime rib job and brings Eve. And I love to think that, you know, he, Adam opens his eyes and there's love at first sight. Desire enters the uh, world and God brings them first ever arranged marriage. God brings Adam and Eve together. They're naked. They feel no shame and they are united in one flesh. How exciting is that? And God looks on them and he says, this is very good. So there is a complementarity between male and female. And we looked at Psalm 139, you formed my inner parts, you knit me. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, our genitals, our bodies are created for each other. Now, I'm a doctor, I'm also an anatomist. I love genitals because God did such a good job with them. I mean, gentlemen, you should be so proud of what God did when he made a penis. It's just a masterpiece of engineering and plumbing and the vagina just right to hang on to the littlest but allow the head of the baby through perfection of male female and desires and behavior all created before the fall adam and eve happy together tending the garden god gives them a command you know be fruitful and multiply not plant apple trees and do mathematics but get out there have good sex and hey i'm going to give you the body that is perfect ladies i mean you know a clitoris is just such a beautiful organ it's the only organ in the body that does nothing other than hang around having fun don't you love a god who actually gives a command to make babies and then makes it the best fun ever. Come back in the evening to learn more about that at the marriage seminar. But then in coming together in that one flesh, we are good man, woman. It's meant to be. However, in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve listen to the Satan. What did Satan say to Eve? He says, did God really say that you shouldn't eat that apple? Did God really say? My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are still listening to Satan when he said, did God really say? 
you shouldn't have sex with someone your same sex you shouldn't have premarital sex we're not talking about that now did god really say that you know if you don't like your body you shouldn't change it did god really say and so in our post what i like to call the post genesis 3 fallen world sin enters the world and our desires aren't fit with what god wants for us our very bodies in in matthew 19 jesus speaks about the eunuch you know even our biology is messed up that's where the disorders of sex development i talked about the point or two coming and in our world today people listen to satan the lies and as in romans chapter one we read they exchange the truth of god that we just looked at and worship and serve the creature they worship and serve the pleasures of the body rather than the creator of sex and gender so in our cultural moment what you and your children are being taught especially your children if those of you who are parents grandparents aunties uncles hey that includes every one of you should be concerned about your children that's why we wrote the books now if there hopefully there are books out there for you to look at please look at them we have a book for teens which has a whole chapter on gender we have a book for pre teens that's called growing up by the book that covers puberty and today it's so important that our young people understand puberty as good because they are being told that if you don't like what's happening in puberty you can just block it wrong you cannot do it it's part of growing up healthy and god gave it to you we have even a book for primary school because your children are hearing hearing about gender ideology in primary school i have talked to year six kids grade six who are being told that they can choose who they want to be and that mommy and daddy and the doctors just decided when they were born who they were so this cultural moment is teaching our children that your inner self is who you are and your biology does not matter sex therefore becomes something liquid and our gender becomes liquid and we end up with what i like to call an alphabet soup of categories this gender identity as i said cannot be measured and everything in your world and especially in your children's world is being measured now not founded in biology but through this unmeasurable vague inner feeling of gender identity so what do we have we have our children being told that sex is assigned at birth never use that word sex is not assigned it is determined at the moment of conception they are told that biology is actually bigotry to say that a woman is an adult human female with ovaries and the capacity to produce eggs is bigotry you are a transphobe for saying it similarly to defend a man to define a man as an adult human male with testes and the potential to produce sperm is bigotry lesbians and gays especially lesbians are being told now what did i tell you same sex attraction is attraction to someone of your same sex stay with here transgender ideology or the lgbtqia plus 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 to 80 tells lesbians and gays that you must be attracted to someone of the same gender identity what does this mean 
Give me a moment to explain to you what what's driving lesbians and gays like round the bend now. Lesbians especially are being told you have to be attracted to anyone who says self-ID themselves as a woman. So any of you gentlemen, well, I won't personalize it, but a man who says I am a woman, even if he has all his male bits, genitals, penis, scrotum, a lesbian must be willing to have sex with him. See that? She's lesbian. She's attracted to other women biologically. But she is now told that if a man says he is a woman, then she must have sex with him. It's a huge big area there. So sexual orientation is being reframed under gender ideology. Biological sex is being reframed. What about behavior? This is what we are most concerned about. And this is children. Children who don't clearly fit into what is seen as a stereotype of male, boy, male, is being told he is a girl. Girl who doesn't fit in, the kind of tomboy, is being told you are a boy. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the moment for your children. Please talk to the children in the church, whatever age they are. We have a book there called Talking Sex by the Book. And that is for all of you to read because it says, how do you talk to them under five, five to 10, 10 to 15 and over 15? You have to talk to them because if you don't talk to them, they're going to be caught up in the gender ideology and that alphabet soup. Now I'll tell you a few words and you're going to think, what, right? Is What are these? Some of you, some of you are probably really well versed so let me tell you. So there's omnigender, agender, non-gender, queen gender, cisgender, non-binary, pangender, bisexual, pansexual, asexual, fluid. Right. I like even from here, I can see some of the looks, confusion on some people's faces. See, we used to talk about gay, les, maybe bisexual when it came to sexual orientation. Ah, but today there's pansexual. I can be attracted to anyone, pan. Or there's asexual, which means says I'm not sexually attracted to anyone. Or it can be romantic, but I'm not sexually attracted. Or I can be fluid and be anything. Then in this kind of unmeasurable ephemeral gender identity, there is non-binary, which is the weirdest word ever, because it says there's male and female, but I'm, you know, neither male nor female. I'm something in between, but I am something but I'm something in between. And then there's a gender, which is, I have no biological sex. You are, you are a male or a female, but my identity is nothing. Or I'm omnigender, I'm all genders. Or I am, and stay, this is the one that we need to be really careful about. The word cisgender, C-I-S. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, some of you may be even working in a place which asks you to have a pronoun or asks you to say, I am cisgender. Cisgender is a transgender ideology word that says you, you, in your inner feeling, you accept who you really are. Like, hello, I know who I am. It is how I was born. So may I recommend to you that you do not use the word cisgender because you are immediately accepting that transgender ideology of that there is an inner essence rather than the biological reality and the God-given created goodness of your body. That's the confusion. Please ask me questions if you have <laughs> like, like you understood everything clearly so far, but if you still want clarification and get my email, send me, but ask questions. So let's move on from there to the talk of today, and that is about transgender and gender dysphoria. Now the word transgender is a word that just says, remember the new terminology, language has pretty much been like hijacked the sex gender identity language. Transgender is one of those new words, maybe 1980, 
We didn't have transgender as a word in the vocabulary. Transgender just means my inner feeling doesn't match my biological reality. So the non-reality of this inner feeling. So a few people there have always, I said, transsexual. It's about, I think, something about 16 or so in 100,000 people had that and some people went on to surgery. This is so, it was a rare condition. Today, gender clinics across the world, Australia also, have, hang on to your chairs, about 4,000, you heard right, 4,000% increase of referrals of children and teenagers for gender problems. The word is used is gender dysphoria. I am distressed with what my body is, especially teenagers. Now, this feeling of distress can be very real. We live in a post Genesis 3 fallen world, Romans chapter 8. We say the whole, we read, whole of creation is groaning and the distress is part of our groaning our desires are not in keeping with god's word jeremiah 17 the heart is deceitful desperately sick even jesus said in matthew 15 out of the heart come evil thoughts murder adultery sexual immorality all these desires that are not in keeping but the distress is there. Think of an iceberg. There's a little bit on top, but there's a whole lot underneath. And that's the bit we need to understand. Now, unfortunately, that's not what is happening. This disjunct and the distress is immediately being treated. And I'll get to that in a moment. So we need to, for a few moments, talk about what causes it and what can we do as Christians? So let's talk a little bit about what causes it because your children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews are facing this. Please don't think that because you're in Tamworth or Canada or wherever you are, you are immune to this. You are not because your kids are binging on social media and they are exposed to transgender ideology. And there are people out there who want to indoctrinate your children. And I don't know what's happening in your schools, but there are schools all over where primary school children are being taught this gender ideology that there's this inner soul. Adults, we, like I told you in 1980, we were seeing adults. And there were a few and they were very distressed and some of them lived with it some of them wanted surgery but there was always a very strict psychological assessment now what about this rapid increase one of the set one of the areas we are really concerned about is young teens especially girls in 1980 we were seeing a few people and men adult men today that rapid increase in teen girls. And there's a history there. You can almost find a pattern. Almost, I used to speak a lot in Christian schools, pre-COVID, now just a few. But every school I've been to, we have teenage girls who have been very girly girl, not even any kind of that gender non-conforming. And all of a sudden, they go into their teens and they're like, I'm a boy. That's called, we've given it a term, it's not diagnosis, a term called rapid onset gender dysphoria. These are girls, and I'm saying girls, although we are seeing more boys, who have a history of binging on social media. Many of, many of them with mental health concerns, largely autism, direct correlation with autism spectrum and gender dysphoria, that fixed kind of thinking. If I feel this way, then I must be this way. So kids who have mental problems, binging on social media, often the ones who are like not quite fitting in, gender non-conforming kids, and they 
get into chat rooms like Reddit and the, the kind of video games like Roblox that read into chat rooms. And they get into transgender forums. And a girl puts in, I don't like my body. I don't like my breast development. Or like, I've had a period and I hate it. Like, hello, ladies, how many of us went, yes, my first period, hurrah, let's celebrate. But today's kids are told, if you don't like your puberty, you can just block it. You don't have to suffer with this female breast. We can give you what's called a binder to hold your breasts in so you look more boyish. We can give you a drug that will stop your puberty. And then you can decide whether you really want to be a girl. Now a boy who doesn't like his penis development or he doesn't like his hairy, smelly armpits or whatever, he gets in and says, I don't like puberty. And he said, oh, then you must be a girl. Let's help you. And there are schools where a child, even a child, now we're talking teens, even a child who goes and says, I'm uncomfortable with it can be given a new name and then parents not even told about it. In some schools, we are seeing clusters of girls. It is popular to have a name, a gender label. I go to year grade eight, grade nine, it seems to be that cusp year where girls say, everybody in my class, of course, everybody, everybody has a gender label. It's the, the current term. I hope, or maybe you're not, is walk, walk, W-O-K-E, the popular term for in-group. I'm the in-group. It, it's hot or it's cool to have a gender term. We even talk of a term called social contagion. You know, there was a time when everyone wanted to be like got, or everyone wanted a tattoo. Now everybody wants a gender label. This is what we are seeing. And in children, now, let me tell you something. There is nothing called a trans child. You may hear this. You know, this. you have a trans child. Celebrate it. Nonsense. You have a healthy boy or girl, son or daughter. Nothing called a trans child. It's a child who is unhappy with his or her body at puberty or pre-puberty. It's a child who's a boy who likes to behave like a girl and therefore has been told that he is a girl or a girl who's tomboyish and told therefore you must be a boy. Your child is not born in the wrong body. Your child is not a trans child because they don't fit into the stereotype. Even if they say, I don't like my body, even if they say, I want to be the other, which I did, don't buy the world's lie. That is a lie. Don't buy into it. Your children are too precious, far more precious. But the distress may be real. So what can we do? We scientists talk of three ways it can be dealt with. You can change, you know, there's a body and there's a feeling. The body is reality. The feeling is this ephemeral, unmeasurable inner sense of who you are. So what do you got? You got a body and you got a feeling. You can change the body to fit the feeling. And that is what is being even made law in certain states south of the border, Victoria, where affirmation, listen to that word, you are affirming what the child wants. Listen to the children, you're told. You have an eight-year-old who comes and says, let's say it's a son, who says, I got, I am a girl. Now your eight-year-old probably doesn't know what they want for dinner. They cannot vote, they cannot join the army, they cannot um, get married, but they can change their gender. This is what you are being told under affirmation. You must affirm. And what does this mean? It means that this little child, your little son, will be given a girl's name, allowed to wear girl's clothes and behave like a girl. That's affirmation. And you are told that you must do it. 
And in certain states, if you don't do it, you are a bad parent, you're abusive, and social services can actually come and take your child away. This could happen. It's not happened here yet, but it could. That's affirmation. Now, reality. Science research clearly tells us that children who are unhappy with their body, like I was, with being a girl, if allowed to live in their body, we call it living in the skin God gave you. They say living in your skin. I had the, what God gave you. By the time they reach puberty, they accept the body they are born in, the biology. But if they are affirmed, and then the next step is given drugs to block puberty, we call, they are called puberty blockers, but you can't, there's science there. Then almost 100% will go in to cross-sex medication and even surgery. This is making your body fit your feelings. Your feelings are primary. The drugs that are used to block the brain, puberty, and to change the body appearance. Remember, you cannot change your biology. Your biology remains the same. All you are changing is what you look like. It's cosmetic. You cannot change your biology. And those drugs do affect your brain and your whole bones and blood. They are serious. And I'm making it very short here. It's a big topic here. And surgery, boys have their penis cut off and the scrotum testes removed. Girls with their genitals, you know, the ovaries and uterus removed at 15 and 16 years old when the brain isn't even mature. Now, what is the option we have? What we have is that we've got a body, body and feeling. We can help the child, children and even adults who are confused to work on the feeling to fit into the reality of God's given body. That is what we, we should be helping people with. And helping people to live with the distress. That's what the church is for. We are all distressed people. That's why we are here. Because we are never happy. Because we are exiles. We are, not, we are, we are aliens. We are unhappy in our body. We are unhappy because we are, we, are, we are meant for a better place, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. The promise of eternity is what we hold out to everybody. So we know we have this clarity of who we, the science, only a little bit, but you've learned a bit. You know what the culture is telling you. And we know the biblical certainty. Now, how do we apply that? We look at the world of fallen people, including us, and we look at this gender confusion and we have deep compassion. We are mourning in the Beatitudes and Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, mourn with those who mourn. We mourn with people who are struggling with gender. We mourn with people who have mental illness and we tell them we have a better story. We have something to offer you where you can, you don't have to change your good body just because you feel different. But we can help you with supporting you and loving you and caring for you, speaking the truth in love and pointing to Jesus. Because there and there alone, as we look to eternity, is true happiness, true joy. So we help people who are distressed. But even more importantly, and this is where the church needs to be, is to prepare our people, like your church wonderfully is doing, and to teach our children from the time they are very young, that the body is good and God made it the way it is meant to be. I have been asked now to write a book for preschoolers, a picture book. How sad is that? 
that we have to start talking at preschool. In our primary school book, we have six set of six books. One of them is understanding gender. We have to talk to our primary schoolers. Otherwise, they go and get indoctrinated in school. All ages, you have to talk. Prepare your children and read the word of God. Sit with it. Be open to be fearless to talk. Will we be persecuted? Probably. Some of us have been already. But the reality is that we live in a broken world and we have the truth. We cannot not speak into the world. We need to be ready. That there is an increasing number, of especially young women, who are going through all the process which is called transition and then regretting it. Our churches need to be ready to welcome the transitioned, the detransitioners, the confused. Our churches need to be ready to accept all sinners because my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, so are we. Our churches need to be hospitals for sinners like us. We can no longer afford to be five-star resorts for the righteous. That is our challenge, whether it be gender or anything else. God bless you. Thank you. Stick around. We're now going to continue the conversation. If you have any questions about what was spoken about in that talk, feel free to email us at info at thechapelcollective.com.au and we'll endeavour to have a conversation with you. This is my favourite question. It says, 75, girl, give us the skincare routine. <laughs> I'm tempted to say lots of good sex, but they won't. <laughs> Um, I do have one question from my daughter. She says, what do you do if you've had a tra traumatic experience with your parents? <laughs> um, but we don't need to go there. Talk to, okay. them. Talk to them about it. Yeah, ask it. them about it. Bella, we'll talk about it later. That'll be fun. Okay. Um, here's a question, a theological question. When we get to heaven and there are no sexes, no differentiation, what are the implications of that? Okay. 1 Corinthians 15 says that we will have a new body. So there will be a body. We are also told that there will be no marriage in heaven other than the marriage between Christ and the church. So there's no marriage, but there is some bodies that we will be given. And we are also told elsewhere that right now we see light in a mirror, not clearly. But when we are in heaven, we will see clearly. So it seems, this is what theologians think, that we will have a body as to whether we will have genitals, we don't know exactly, but the chances are that if we are bodied, embodied, we will be male or female. And But that won't really matter. We won't be thinking sex because our thoughts will be based on glorifying God, which they're supposed to be now. But there it will be truly able to be that way. So yeah, it will be, as I said, heaven is far better than sex, far better than the best orgasm you have ever had. So keep that in mind. You know, when you're having that, you know, five volts over the Harbour Bridge orgasm, heaven is going to be better. Think about heaven. You know, when that, you know, when you shout out, oh God, oh God, you really mean it because God is better. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, um, in a world where the media almost always involves the LGBTQI+, how do we watch TV or do other things without it even becoming normalised in our own minds? Good, because when you, you've got to be critical, because that's the whole thing. I mean, you know, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, do not conform to the world, but be renewed in your mind, because then you can test the world. So you need to know the truth. You have to be in the world, but we are called to be not of the world. We have to critically test what we are hearing. And you don't, so if you don't, if you find that it's pushing it, read it, talk to your children about it, because it's a teaching opportunity. And then 
point them to the truth of the Word of God. Um, Patricia, some of us might be tempted, like with young children in particular, to, you know, say something like, oh, the, you, like the latest um, Lightyear movie, I think two characters, uh, two boy characters kiss, to say something like, Ugh, like, oh, that's, to our children, oh, that's gross. What's a good way of having that discussion without being judgmental yeah. or whatever it might be? Yeah. So what you say, what, what I recommend is like, you see something, two men kissing two women. Look, it doesn't have to be on a movie. It's on the streets, you know, you see it played out in a so-called pride parade on the television. And so you need to, that's a good opportunity to talk. And if it's a little child, you use the books, as I said, you know, it, that's what we made it for. Read the gender book with them and tell them God made it good. But sometimes, you know, our feelings are messed up. And instead of like, you know, mommy and daddy, you know, you see us kiss and they better see you kiss. It's good for them. Cuddling at the kitchen sink, highly recommended. You know, even if they run in the bedroom while you're having sex, it's okay. It's a teaching moment, not at that moment, but it is a teaching moment. So hold on to that. The reality is that you tell them, look, mommy and daddy cuddle and kiss. That's how God meant it to be. And we make babies. But you know, in our messed up world, sometimes two men or two women, they think that friendship love is about sex. You know, two men can be really good friends. Use it at a time to talk about non-sexual intimate friendships. Two men can be really good friends, David and Jonathan. Two women can be really good friends, Naomi and Ruth. And then talk about, but in our world, these things get messed up. And it's not the way it's meant to be because the reality is two men cannot make a baby. Two women cannot make a baby. It means a man and a woman to make a baby. Can you see how many things you could teach using that one thing? And that's so important. Uh, a, a question, um, I'm not sure where this person's coming from. Maybe uh, the Holy Spirit will just lead you, Patricia, in your answer. It says, I'm divorced and I'm now in a place where I'm ready to find someone new. Um, I'm unsure where my mind is sexually. Uh, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I'll just quickly say that I mean, I talk to people all the time because divorce is a really hard place because let me just take you to the science with this congregation we haven't really talked about a lot. But the point is that desire and love are feelings. But when you have sexual intimacy with someone, you bind at a brain level, oxytocin, vasopressin. So when you're married, you've had sex and you have bonded to that person. Now, when you are divorced, maybe the person left you, whatever the reason, or even when you have lost your spouse to death, you grieve the person and the death, you grieve the loss. But in divorce, you may be angry, but you still miss that bonding that you've caused to break up. And I talk to divorcees who say, I hate my husband, but I still miss him when I get into bed because you bonded and it's tearing something that is super glued. So what I recommend to someone who's after a divorce, firstly, do not rush into another relationship because then you're thinking that just because that glue tearing hurts, you can stick another bit on it. Doesn't work that way. Take the time to work through the grief with, a, with a, another Christian, somebody who understands older person or someone in your age group, work through the grief and then go out and meet other Christians and see where it leads. That's wonderful. Um, a, a comment, thank you so much, Patricia. God is using you in such an amazing way to challenge unstable culture at this time. Um, here's a question. What does asexuality or the lack of interest in sex, where does that fit in with everything? Okay. The word asexuality, and apparently there's about 1% of the population now that measures in that, means I am not, I don't feel sexually attracted to anyone, men, women, anything. Now, that doesn't mean that I can't be romantically like love someone. I just don't want to have sex. Now, if that person is asking this thinking that you're in a married situation, that's a different situation. And we really need to talk about that more in detail tonight if someone has a question. But 
if you don't feel turned on sexually with someone, the one advice I have is, look, there are people who are like that. And I have occasionally had a teenager come up to me. I love this particular story about a year, grade eight or nine, who came up to me and said, everybody has a gender label, but I think I'm asexual. Is that all right? And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Your parents will probably be hoping you stay that way forever. <laughs> but the reality is that if you do honestly feel that I feel icky about sexual relationship, don't get married. Because that's not fair by your partner, you know, because you, you, you can't feel that way and then think just because I got the wedding ring, I'm suddenly going to turn into this super diva sexual athlete. It doesn't quite work that way. You need to, if you're really keen on getting married, you need to talk to your partner, you need to get counseling. That's what asexuality means. Wow. Um, Patricia, just reminded me, as a pastor, a lot of people will come to me and say, you know, I was instructed to avoid sex like the plague. Then all of a sudden I get married, I'm expected to flick a switch. Um, is this afternoon going to help people with that? Definitely, because the reality is that, you know, sex is fun, but it's also messy and it's finding the right place to put the right thing. And that takes a bit of uh, self-knowledge and education. So yeah, we'll be talking about right. that among many other things. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, as a 16 year old, what should I do when I'm called trans or the opposite gender? When you are labeled, is it? The question says when I am called. Yes, either they haven't called themselves that, other people are calling yeah. them that. Yeah, that's, let, let, again, it's, it's hard to generalize. But what I'm going to assume here, that what we see, it's usually some child, a young person, a teenager, who is not gender stereotypical. So it's a boy who doesn't do the boofy things, doesn't want to play the rough and tumble, but would rather be with the girls, like maybe music and dancing and wanting to play the violin. And that boy would be called trans as a kind of a derogatory term or being told, you know, maybe you are a girl or a girl who likes to play soccer and, you know, rough and tumble and wants to fix the car with daddy is told that you are a boy. So it's usually gender stereotype. And like I said, that is not just because you don't have the preferences and the behavior that fit in the stereotype does not mean you are transgender. So the thing is, if you are being labeled, it's just to not take any notice of it because that is not who you are. You are a precious child of God, given an identity by God, and that is who you are. Wonderful. Um, I have a daughter uh, in year eight who has no interest in boys or girls. Um, oh, I think you've kind of answered this before. I, I, I think we were right there. Uh, how do we talk? You, you touched on this and I loved what you said about us being sinners. How do we talk with empathy with Christian brothers and sisters and non-Christian friends who really insist that they're in the wrong body? How do we speak the truth in love? Yeah, the first thing and the most important thing you do is not hit them on the head with the truth, but be a friend. The best thing you can do is love people into the kingdom. So be a friend, listen, be a friend and listen, 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 listen before you speak. And if you can get them, read the gospel with them. So be a friend, listen, and then take them to the word of God. Let the Holy Spirit do the conviction. The moment you confront, you're a bigot, you're a transform. So step back from confrontation and love them into the kingdom. Beautiful. Um... Okay, my daughter's concerned that I said I have a daughter who, I'm just letting everyone know that that was a question that was asked, okay? <laughs> Sorry, Kate. Okay, um, text messages. Okay, uh, one more question, um, unless any more come through. Um, why do you think that sex is so tied up? You know, girls used to and still do have beautiful friendships. Boys have beautiful friendships like David and Jonathan. Why do you think that um, it's pushed upon them that that should be sexual as well? It's the cultural desire driven world we live in where everything is sexualized, everything. And porn is porn. You know, porn has sexualized everything. And with the average age of porn exposure, 10 years and dropping, 
from a very early age, kids are being told, if you have girl and girl friendship, you must be less. I mean, I, you're a grade six kid come up to me and say, I love bestie. I guess I'm a lesbian. Or a boy come and say, I love girls and I love boys. I guess I'm bisexual. You're just a normal girl and you're just a normal boy who loves boys and girls. That's called friendship. And we've lost that because from a very early age, our kids are being sexualized. And that's why we need to be talking. Please talk to your children. Um, I hope there's another question after this because I don't really want to end on this question. But um, why does porn uh, tend so violent and male dominant? Uh, that's because that makes money. What makes money? And it's about sex trafficking and the fem female domination and violence makes money. So that's why it's popular. We hope you enjoyed today's service. Thank you for joining with us. We hope, trust and pray that God inspired you through the service this morning. Remember, God is with you. See you soon.